All right, all right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this special edition of Heal Thyself. It has been quite a while since I had the opportunity to speak to you all again under this unprecedented circumstances, but I am here again to educate, to inform, to empower, doing the stuff that I love doing, love disseminating to you all, and I know you all love receiving, so uh, welcome back to the show. It's good to be back. Um, we haven't really missed a week before all of this uh, staying at home quarantining business, but um, we missed what now too, but we are back. We got all the technicals in place and we are ready to put this show back out every single week. All right. So uh, it's really a new feeling to me to not be able to educate um, in so long. So I'm really happy to say that we are here again and I do have a lot to say today. So it's going to be a really good show. Lots of good empowering information. But before we jump in, I want to say a little bit, a little piece, just a little tiny piece, a little take home. Right. So I hope you're all staying safe and healthy in this unprecedented time. Right. Probably one of the only times in our lives we'll experience something like this, but I hope you're finding the time to reconnect to something, right? Whether it be family, friends, pets, even downtime, which was something is uh, something I've been reconnecting with very much so. But more importantly than anything, I hope you're connecting with yourself, right? Finding the time to remember who you are because we're in this hustle and bustle at nine to five and then coming home and then cooking and then maybe watching a little TV and going to sleep and we start losing connection with who we are. So that person, before all the conditioning that we had in our lives when we were young and pure, right, that false identity that we've created for ourselves, I hope that we're able to remember now who we are in this time because in this quarantine, in this staying at home, sheltering in place, we get this golden, we get to have this golden opportunity to revisit ourselves. So I just wanted to put that out there for everyone. So uh, hopefully you're in a good mental state right? So you're feeling like uh, you can go forth with this for however long, because now you're really getting in touch with yourself. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm not going so crazy. I really miss going out to eat and connecting with community and friends. But with that said, this is the mindset that I have and I like to share with you all. Today's going to be a really good show. We're going to talk about optimizing your lung health, which is pretty relevant, I would say. And then uh, a review of marinara sauces, tomato sauces, right? The special guest today will be Dr. Will Cole. He's a leader in functional medicine, so it's going to be a really good episode with him. So without further ado, let's get to the night. All right, so for all those who have been following me for quite a while, they know uh, that I'm a nat you know that I'm a naturopathic doctor, func practice functional medicine, naturopathic medicine, really the same tenets, and it's really getting to the root cause. Uh, in naturopathic medicine, we have these principles that we abide by, and some of my favorite ones go like this. Identifying the root cause, of course, which is something that I've been talking about since day one, um, since I've even been starting in Instagram, one of my first posts was about the root cause. But really, the two major ones are giving the body what it needs to heal and removing the obstacles to cure or healing, right? And you can't do one without the other and experience true healing, right? You can't give the body all this great food and great nutrients, but have all of these self-sabotaging habits in your life. So we know the body has an ability to heal itself. We know there's this phenomenon of homeostasis, balance, right? We, we get a cut or a broken bone and we expect it to heal without thinking about the process that happens, right? We get a sore on our lip, but that, that sore on our lip heals over time, right? We get sick and if our body's vital enough, it mounts a defense and then we get better over time. We expect this to happen because it happens so seamlessly, right? It's very elegant. The body's so intelligent and smart. So as long as we give the body what it needs to heal and remove those obstacles to healing, the body does what it does best, and it's balance. All right, so in light of this coronavirus thing, I wanted to talk about respiratory health. It's so important to optimize our respiratory health overall to protect us. And a healthy respiratory tract is not only healthy breathing, but it's also giving us a robust defense system against infections, particulate matter from pollution and all that crap in the air. A healthy respiratory tract means we have open airways, which equal better sleep, which equal overall health. So with those themes in mind, let's talk about how do we give the body what it needs to heal? We have to think about our respiratory system, right? And it's protecting us, like I said, from infections and environmental insults. We have this thing called this mucociliary system where we produce this mucus and then we have these cilia that expel all that crap that's trapped in the mucus. Really intelligent design. But also on a nutritive level, we have to think about something deeper that we can give our body and protect 
and really strengthen our uh, respiratory system, and it's antioxidants, right? So antioxidants, antioxidants, antioxidants. It's so important, not just overall in every other system, but we don't think about the respiratory system and how it utilizes antioxidants to keep it healthy. So in the respiratory system, the major antioxidants are mucin, ascorbic acid, vitamin C, glutathione, which you heard me talk about before, and fat-soluble vitamins like vitamin A, D, and E. So mucin is a glycoprotein. That's just a protein with a carbohydrate molecule attached to it, right? And it's found throughout the respiratory tract. And the major role is in the mucociliary defense, where I mentioned creating mucus and those cilia that remove that, those particles that are within the mucus, and then we spit, we spit them out, right? We cough them up. That's for lubrication and defense. It's really a part of that whole system. But also, it's an important antioxidant. Now, how do we give our respiratory system mucin? How do we provide it the mucin? We find that it's connected to dietary fiber, which is something that I talk about all the time, particularly prebiotic rich foods that are high in inulin, which is the prebiotic fiber that we want. That's asparagus, that's chicory, that's garlic, that's Jerusalem artichoke, jicama, onions, etc. I talk about prebiotics for a reason. It's not just in the feeding the microbiome, which is also helping us with overall immunity and protection, reducing inflammation, right? Reducing allergic symptoms, which can affect our respiratory system, but also it's feeding our respiratory tract, our lungs, which is so important. So already we know that fiber plays an important role all throughout our body. Ascorbic acid, vitamin C, this reduces oxidation, right? That's reducing free radicals in the body in the respiratory tract, reducing oxidation. So vitamin C is uh, very much so concentrated in the alveoli. The alveoli are these little sacs in the lung that are exchanging air, right? We need them, they're, they're in our lungs. So they, we have 30 times more vitamin C in these white blood cells that are present in the alveoli. So it's protecting us, it's protecting our lungs, right? From pneumonia, from infection. So really important that we need to have a sufficient level of vitamin C. A lot of folks out there are in a chronic state of stress and vitamin C is a nutrient that our adrenal glands use readily. So if we're using these uh, adrenal glands to, if they're overworking, they're using a lot of vitamin C, we're depleting our vitamin C, we're not eating high vitamin C rich foods, then we understand how our lungs can be vulnerable as well. So what uh, it's protecting us from infection, I mentioned that, reducing the oxidation, uh, it's also important in collagen synthesis. So the structure of our respiratory tract, we want vitamin C in our body. Foods with high vitamin C, guava, kiwis, bell peppers, strawberries, oranges, grapefruits, lemons, limes, papaya, you know what, even kale, broccoli, and tomato. So make sure you're getting all these different color foods rich in vitamin C throughout the day. Glutathione, I mentioned this so many times and I mentioned it in reference to the liver. It's a master antioxidant, right? We love glutathione. Well. It's also an antioxidant in the lungs. It reduces the pro-inflammatory states in the lungs. Low glutathione has been linked to abnormal abnormalities in lung surfactant. Lung surfactant is what keeps that surface tension in the lungs so they don't collapse on each other. So glutathione has, has an important role in keeping the lungs healthy and tense so there's healthy airway exchange. It also helps regulate our immunity. Now, some things about glutathione, you can find them in foods like asparagus, avocado, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, spinach, broccoli, garlic, chives, which are one of my favorites, tomatoes, cucumbers, almonds, walnuts. But here's the thing. When you cook these foods, it can lose about 30 to 60 percent of glutathione in itself. So a lot of folks, I do recommend taking liposomal glutathione or even folks who have respiratory issues. You can talk to your doctor about nebulized glutathione to help reduce those that oxidation in the um, respiratory tract. This is not medical advice, but this is something I do love giving to patients who it's indicated for. The fat soluble vitamins, vitamin A, D, E, right? These are vitamins which are stored in the fat, right? Um, so they're utilized to repair lung tissue. It's essential for healthy alveoli as well as overall lung maintenance, right? I said the alveoli, remember them? The little sacs in our lungs that are exchanging air, really important for that health. And overall, just lung maintenance, as I said, vitamin A is important in preventing respiratory infections. What we see is that folks with reduced vitamin A antioxidant in the lungs are more predisposed to things like pneumonia, right? So vitamin A rich foods, sweet potato, carrots, butternut squash, papaya, broccoli, leafy greens, eggs, fish, organ meats, 
Um, then we have things like vitamin D, right? Mostly in animal products, but more importantly, you're getting that from the sunlight, which is why I talk about the sun so much. And vitamin E, sun, uh, seeds, nuts like avocado, spinach, broccoli, kiwi, leafy greens, and some fish. Also, when we want to optimize our lung health, we want to talk about reducing systemic inflammation as a whole. So this is, again, the basic stuff, basic stuff which I teach, talking about getting uh, a whole food, nutrient-rich diets, reducing processed sugars, uh, processed foods, trans fats, getting all that crap out of there, eating more organic, right? Taking away the chemicals that disrupt the microbiome, increase oxidation, uh, disrupt our other organs, increase inflammation overall in the body. This is, this is all going to affect our respiratory tract. And then getting in spices like turmeric, ginger, cayenne, rosemary, basil, really important antioxidants. These have nutrients in our body that are feeding our lungs. So if for, for me, this goes without saying, the healthier the overall body as we see, the healthier the respiratory tract, the healthier the breathing, the healthier the sleeping, the healthier the defense against infection. So again, we can't just think like pulmonologists. We have to think full body holistic, right? And then even supplementing. So I talked to your doctor about things like uh, curcumin or turmeric uh, supplements, boswellia, bromelain, that'll reduce systemic inflammation. Now that's talking about giving the body what it needs, but remember the other half of it is removing those obstacles to healing, right? Your respiratory system is not going to be best unless you start removing those obstacles that are affecting it. And if you recall, I did a show on food allergies and food intolerances. And it's really important to understand this because when we are exposed to, our immune system is exposed to these proteins and foods that are throwing it off, it's going to affect our respiratory system, right? So food allergies and intolerance, uh, there's more than 20% of folks in industrial countries who suffer from them, right? Um, so we talk about the IgG and IgE, and I mentioned those in the food allergy and intolerance show. And IgE are really the, uh, the immune reaction, the antibodies that are uh, responding to food allergies. These are the things that cause, let's say, remember when um, you heard a story of the kid in the school who ate peanut and he, had, uh, he, he couldn't breathe and he needed an EpiPen. Well, that's because there was swelling in his larynx and sprat bronchospasms of his bronchi. This happens, this can be very dangerous, can lead to anaphylaxis. This happens when there's an IgE antibody mediated reaction. Now, food intolerances, and back, I'm, I'm sorry, let me go before I say that. IgE, uh, the common foods are cause, uh, that are common allergens are milk, soy, eggs, wheat, shellfish, peanuts, tree nuts, right? But really, I want to talk about IgG mediated reactions, and these are the food intolerance ones. So, for IgG mediated reactions, these symptoms can be multi systemic, not just in the digestive system, where you can feel bloating and heartburn and changes in bowels, but also it can affect your skeletal system, musculoskeletal system. So you can, you can feel something like joint pain for some folks, maybe the neurological one, maybe some folks will get headaches, right, some dizziness, or respiratory, like changes in breathing. So when you test for food allergies or food intolerances, um, I, I'm not a fan of the testing because there's uh, so much risk for cross-reactivity. So for you, what can come up really high is broccoli, but you, your body is doing so well with broccoli and you don't understand why that's coming up. Well, it could be cross-reactivity for other foods. So the testing is iffy. There's one test that is really good and it's by Cyrex, but it's very expensive, but they do take into account the cross-reactivity. But for me, Really important is for folks to start food journaling and writing their breakfast, lunch, and dinner and their associated symptoms so they can start becoming investigators of their own body's reactions to food. And really the ultimate way is just through an elimination diet where you can remove all of the foods, start with the really non-antigenic foods, the ones that are not creating immune system reactions, and then slowly introducing and you'll be able to see how your body's reacting. A lot of us are not in touch with our body. So it's really important to get back in touch with your body to see how you're reacting to food. All right, so what else affects the respiratory tract aside from food intolerances, right? Histamine. So histamine uh, is the, the body reacts by releasing histamine to certain allergens or even infections. So what happens when there's an intolerance to histamine or an excessive amount of this histamine released and sensitivity to it, uh, it can narrow those bronchial tubes, right? Increase the swelling, sort of like we see in food allergies. So some folks are very particularly sensitive. Uh, so what we want to do is for those folks, reduce those foods that are high in histamine. And those are the, really the microbial produced ones. So here's a situation where 
uh, fermented foods might not be indicated for people if they have histamine intolerance and until we fix the root cause of why the histamine intolerance is there. So that's things like pickled cabbage, red wine, vinegar, certain cheeses, um, even, even certain fish like tuna fish, mackerel, shellfish, chocolates, even citrus, even wheat germ. Uh, so we, we want to pay attention to the foods that have histamine, but we also want to pay attention to the foods that reduce the enzyme that breaks down histamine, and that's DAO, diamino oxidase. And those foods, the, 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 the foods that inhibit DAO are really in black tea, mate teas, different colorants, and alcohol across the board is going to affect histamine. So if you have issues with histamine, you want to get off the alcohol 100% until we start fixing the root cause. And it can be very, it can be different reasons, right? Chronic histamine related issues can be aggravated or caused by chronic diseases, chronic infections or subacute infections, uh, chronic stress, environmental exposures, gut issues. So it's really got to get to the root cause of why you have the histamine intolerance in general. But what I'm saying, trying to showing you and trying to say is that histamine intolerance is causing a lot of these respiratory issues too. You want to avoid moldy foods. Moldy foods are also going to cause immune hypersensitivity. So not eating leftovers, eating fresh foods if you're having respiratory reactions. So pay attention if you're eating leftovers, what happens to your breathing. Um, it's, it can, it, the same foods are basically in line with the histamine producing foods, a lot of coffees, teas, canned foods, cheeses, vinegar, sour cream, yogurts, high yeast foods like sourdough bread. So again, I mentioned fermented foods like sauerkraut, cider, pickled foods, dried foods. Um, and again, I speak so much about mold, not only in the environment, but now we have to pay attention in the food. So again, pay close attention if you're having reactions to foods with mold or leftovers, uh, as it can be part of the big picture as well as your environmental exposure. And one of the last parts, uh, one of the last things that can really affect your breathing or your respiratory tract that we don't talk about is the cross allergies, right? So let's say you go out and you know that your, um, your allergist told you when you were little that you're allergic to pollen or, or, or certain grasses. Well, did you know that this allergy can cross react with food, right? Because there's similarities in the structure. So if you're allergic to tree pollen, Sometimes, for some folks, if they eat pomaceous fruits like apples, pears, cherries, or hazelnuts, or walnuts, or pistachios, they can have the same allergic reactions as if they're being exposed to tree pollen, which is really interesting. That's, that's the whole concept of cross-reactivity. When we talk about grasses, well, that can mimic, uh, your, your allergies can be mimicked by tomatoes, kiwis, celeries, wheat, rye, oats. They can mimic certain allergies to grasses outdoors. So things like mugwort pollen can be mimicking things like spices from anise, parsley, chamomile, or celery, raw carrot, nuts. One of my favorite is that latex. If you have a latex allergy, certain foods like pineapple, kiwi, avocado, potatoes, bananas, and nuts can mimic that latex allergy. So yeah, and there's other there's other allergies out there in cross reactivity. So it'd be really important and intriguing. Uh, of a concept to see, okay, well, I have an outdoor allergy uh, and I know that my allergist told me it was to birch or oak or grasses, well, that can mimic certain foods and then pay attention to how those foods affect you. Um, and one of the last parts is knowing if you have acid reflux, know that your acid reflux can actually cause asthma, right? You have these nerves in your esophagus that sense that acid when it's coming up and there's a reflex that happens to protect your airways from that acid, uh, destroying it. So what we produce is asthma. So, and I've, I've actually experienced this. When I have heartburn, I always get asthma. And this has been something since I was little. So um, it's real. And if you do have heartburn, think about if it's causing your asthma because that can be the root cause. And then if it is, getting rid of the heartburn. And I did a whole show on that, so go back and check that out. So those are the obstacles to healing. We know that we want to remove those in order to give the body what it needs to heal. And now you know what the body needs to really give ourselves a strong, strong, robust respiratory system, get those antioxidants in there, reduce that systemic inflammation, get out those uh, foods that are really causing inflammation in your respiratory tract, those intolerances, those food allergies, where it could be histamine, it could be ones that are blocking that enzyme. But now we know as a whole what we can do to really protect our respiratory tract, especially in this time. All right. With that said, there's a knowledge bomb. I can't wait to move forward 
to the product review. I've been looking forward to this one. It's been two weeks, so let's get to the product review. All right, today's product review is going to be on marinara, tomato sauce, um, a staple at least where I came from. I grew up with a lot of Italian friends in New Jersey. So I had lots of uh, pasta, lots of tomato sauce. I mean, I've, I've, seen, I've seen the old school Italian grandmas make the uh, marinara sauce from scratch. So I can appreciate, and it's not just Italian grandmas, just grandmas all, all around, but I can appreciate really good tomato sauce. With that said, a lot of the popular ones are crap, right? And what I mean by popular is to ragu, I mean, that's the one that I remember for a long time. And then there's the Prego. Prego and Ragu. It's important to understand that tomatoes, uh, well, the Environmental Working Group came out with the Clean 15 and Dirty Dozen for 2020. They came out with it recently. And they come out with it yearly, and I always talk about it. And it's the foods that basically need to be purchased organic. And those are the Dirty Dozen, the 12 foods. And then the Clean 15, the ones that don't need to be necessarily organic. What we see is that tomatoes are number 10 on the dirty dozen. So they absolutely need to be purchased organic because they are exposed to different pesticides, herbicides, and chemicals that are affecting our gut and our body as a whole. So what are the ingredients in ragu? Now, uh, we had these in our quarantine pantry, uh, not ragu, but the tomato sauces. So that's why I chose to do this um, and was excited to do it. But we don't have any ragu or pregu. So I, uh, if you're looking on video, I'm sorry, I don't have it, but I am gonna read to you the ingredients. Tomato puree, right, and, and mind you, Ragu is not an organic product. Tomato puree, already I said that tomatoes need to be, it's number 10 on the dirty dozen, right? Water, tomato paste, diced tomatoes, uh, calcium chloride, which is a firming agent for it. But the more concerning ones that we're starting to see, aside from the tomatoes not being organic, is citric acid. And I speak about the citric acid. You can almost guarantee if a company is not using organic or non-GMO ingredients, then the citric acid, the sugar, and the soybean oil, which are used here, are coming from GMO foods. And that's a problem because I talk about glyphosate and other chemicals in these foods. Uh, so you always want to make sure if there's citric acid, which is usually coming from genetically modified corn, that it would be doused in glyphosate and coming into your concentrated tomato sauce um, to, to stay away from that. Also the sugar. If it says just ambiguously sugar, and it doesn't say where it came from, if it doesn't say cane sugar, which is non-GMO, then you can guarantee pretty much across the board that that, sh that sugar is coming from GMO sugar beets. Again, doused in glyphosate. And then soybean oil. We know that soybeans are one of the highest uh, GMO foods across the board. And again, again, worried about that being doused in glyphosate. Now, I, I can't guarantee, but again, the, the best rule of thumb is if it's not organic, you can almost guarantee across the board that companies are going to cut costs as best as possible. Anyway, citric acid, sugar, soybean oil, and then it has onion, salt, dehydrated onion, uh, dehydrated onion, spices, garlic powder, and then it has natural flavors. Again, ambiguous can be chemically derived natural flavors, synthetic um, to mimic certain natural flavors, quote unquote. But natural flavors is never it never has to be natural unless it says it says derived from organic ingredients. So. That's what we know about ragu. I would not have it. Another interesting thing is that there's 12 grams of sugar in this tomato sauce for half a cup. It's too much because the ones I'm going to talk about later have, I think, four and six respectively for the, um, well, I'll talk about them later. But regardless, that's too much sugar, 12 grams of sugar. So something to stay away from, another reason to get away from ragu tomato sauce. The Prego tomato sauce is uh, not much better if not worse. Uh, it has non-organic tomatoes. We already mentioned why that's an issue. Uh, sugar, again, likely GMO, which ambiguously sugar. It doesn't say it's coming from cane sugar. Canola oil, which I speak about a lot. Inflammatory, synthetic, uh, likely GMO here. Uh, citric acid, again, just like the ragu one, uh, that, the same issue. And uh, dehydrated onion spices, dehydrated garlic, onion extract, garlic extract. So you have this concentrate of tomatoes, onions, different spices, garlic, but you also have a concentrate of pesticides, herbicides, insecticides. That's why I'm saying to stay away and uh, certainly don't give it to your kids or any women who are pregnant, stay away from this stuff. I do not like it. Let me talk about the good stuff. So the two that we have here uh, are organic bellow, 
there you go. For all the people who are watching, Organic Bello is a marinara sauce um, and made with organic tomatoes, organic tomato puree, organic onions, organic extra virgin olive oil, sea salt, organic basil, organic garlic, organic white pepper, organic black pepper, like it should be made, right? Across the board organic. I mean, to be honest, some of these ingredients don't even need to be organic, but they are organic. And I appreciate that by this organic Bellow company. It's in glass. The other ones are in glass too, but make sure it's always, always, always tomato sauce should be in glass because of the acidity uh, can be leaching if it's in plastic or make sure you never store tomato sauce in plastic uh, or any leftovers in plastic. It always needs to be in glass because it's highly acidic. So Organic Bellow, really good job by them. The other one's by Kirkland. These are the, for the folks who shop at um, Costco. Organic ground tomatoes, tomato puree, organic, organic salted sauteed onions, organic extra virgin olive oil, organic basil, organic garlic, sea salt, and organic black pepper. Very much so similar to this other one. A really good one in glass. You see the USDA organic label. So what I know here is that I have a concentrate that has minimal to no pesticides, herbicide, insecticides. Um, and I feel much more comfortable eating this myself and then giving this to my family. And here's the thing, a, a can of ragu is about five to six bucks, where this can of organic bellows is about six to seven bucks. So a dollar more, you're getting a concentrate that is much healthier, right? And you can be in a place where you're so much more comfortable knowing that it has negligible or very low amounts of pesticides or insecticides, as I mentioned, based on this USDA organic label, which is standardized. So there you go. Marinara sauces. I hope you enjoy your pasta uh, and make sure that you save it in glass, as I said. All right. That is our product review for today. And next we will uh, talk to Dr. Will Cole. I can't wait to put this out there to you. He's one of the brightest minds in functional medicine in the world. And we had the pleasure of having him, having him in here. So without further ado, let's get to our guest. All right, everyone, today's guest, all the way out here from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, my guy Will Cole, author of The Ketotarian Inflammation Spectrum, and we are going to go in on everything about every topic in the history of medicine. Uh, <laughs> no, man, thank you for coming. No pressure, I really right? appreciate it. Yeah, no yeah. pressure, man. All the way out from Pittsburgh, how you like uh, L.A. right now? I used to live here. My wife's from here, so I uh, it's my home away from home for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, know, I know sometimes, and I know what Pittsburgh winter's like. Yes. Right? Because yeah. uh, I, I went to a few Steelers games. I'm not a Steelers fan, but I went to go. Yeah. yeah, I had a friend there. Freezing, cold. Yeah. So now you're out here and the sun's out. So, yeah. so look, you, you've you been doing a lot. You have this inflammation spectrum book out mm -hmm. now, right? And at the very core, the people are benefiting from reducing inflammation. But why? Hey, look, it's a basic question, but it's really important for mm -hmm. us to know. The reduction of inflammation leads to what? I mean, inflammation is the, that sort of underlying commonality between just about every health problem. So people think of it as like maybe like the sore joints or maybe the migraine. They can think of inflammation as, as far as being implicated in that. But it is so much more than that. I mean, chronic inflammation, what we're talking about in the book, is it's associated with autoimmune conditions to digestive problems, musculoskeletal issues. I mean, it really when you talk about diabetes, heart disease, cancer, all of those are chronic inflammatory health problems. Mm -hmm. And what I'm really exploring in the book as well is the fact that we like to separate mental health from physical health mm -hmm. in Western thinking, but mental health is physical health. Our brain is part of our body. And there's a whole field of research looking at what basically the cytokine model of cognitive function. How mm -hmm. is inflammation impacting mental health? How is Im inflammation impacting how our brain works? So when you look at those statistics of anxiety, depression, yeah. fatigue, brain fog, I mean, that's sadly so many people that paired with autoimmune disease, that's and metabolic issues, the majority of the human race. Wow. So it's very, very important for people to realize that the choices that we do in life feed inflammation or fight it. And that's food. And we talk about stress and toxins and you know, sleep. All of these things are either bringing inflammation up or bringing it down. Yeah. And I, what I notice is that a lot in the conventional model, there's, there's not enough combo around. You mentioned toxins mm -hmm. as something that can really drive inflammation. Mm -hmm. But I know in the type of medicine we do, we take that into account big time because it's a big mm -hmm. piece of the pie of the inflammation, mm -hmm. you know, pizza pie. Yeah. Um, 
do you find that do you find that yourself with with people like uh, let's say I know you work one on one right you treat mm -hmm. all That's around my day job is your day job is talking to people online primarily uh, via webcam yeah so we drop ship labs to them and figure out these components what's driving up their inflammation puzzle awesome awesome so I know a lot of people here don't, don't have functional doctors or naturopathic doctors mm -hmm. so maybe they they're wondering what kind of labs can they ask mm -hmm. for. Um, in general, what are you what are you looking for for these folks who have yeah. who you're looking for inflammation and predispositions to those long term diseases as you mentioned? Sure. So there is a sidebar in the book called it's the inflammation spectrum labs. A lot of these you can get with your local doctor. You don't need a functional medicine yeah. doctor, even though we do run them, and or a naturopathic mm -hmm. doctor. You don't. You you can go to your doctor and say, hey, can I have these labs ran? You'll probably have to ask for them, mm -hmm. but these are conventional labs, accessible, affordable for people. And there's a lot of direct-to-consumer labs too where people don't even need any doctor to run some of these. So high-sensitivity C-reactive protein or HSCRP on the lab. In functional medicine, we want that under one. That's an inflammatory marker. Uh, high levels of it are linked to a whole, whole host of different uh, inflammatory health problems. It's a surrogate lab for different interleukins which are associated with many different inflammatory processes. It's not the only way to assess inflammation. You can definitely have an inflammatory state without high sensitivity uh, C-reactive protein, but it's a good accessible lab. It's a, it's, a, it's a good benchmark to get, a baseline to get. So HSCRP homocysteine is another one. Uh, above seven, the studies just show it can act as a neurotoxin. It can improve or in increase uh, blood-brain barrier permeability or, or what's called leaky brain uh, Basically, as someone have, with leaky gut syndrome can have increased blood-brain barrier permeability, homocysteine is implicated in that. Um, and ferritin, which is another accessible lab. Yes, it's a biomarker for stored iron, but it's a way for us to gauge, uh, it's, it's called an acute phase reactant. So in states of inflammation, we can see ferritin spike. Mm -hmm. You have to put that in context with the iron, the iron saturation, mm -hmm. and is it a man or woman? Are they menstruating or not? Like, but in context, high ferritin can be an indicative of inflammation. So that's just a basic test. And mm -hmm. then we get, you know, super geeky in functional medicine where we dig a little bit deeper as to the other components. We look at gut problems, which there's a lot of gut centric components to inflammation because it's the predominance of where the immune system resides. So we're looking at those labs. We're looking at genetic SNPs that make some people more predisposed to inflammation, like MTHFR, the VDR, that gene that I just mentioned, different endocannabinoid gene SNPs. Um, and toxicity, you mentioned that, I think it provoked urine test yeah. and looking at glyphosate and measuring glyphosate in the body. These are all things that we can look at as what's upstream to that inflammation. Cause we're, yes, we're talking about inflammation here, but inflammation isn't inherently bad. It, it fights viruses and bacteria. It's a good thing in balance. Well, I'm talking about here in the inflammation spectrum is inflammation thrown out of balance. So we have to say, well, why is the body disturbed? Why is something that's supposed to be good thrown out of balance? And why is this, this forest fire burning in perpetuity? Things like toxins, things like stress, things like gut problems can be driving that. That's pretty incredible. And, and I, don't think, I don't think we look at that, right? Because yeah. we always think, how can we negate in all inflammation in our body without understanding that that process is there for a really particular reason? Yeah. Uh, as you mentioned, just even fighting infection. Most of us have that snowball growing, right? And we're mm -hmm. just like adding on to it because of, you know, these choices in our lives, uh, exposures, as you mentioned, toxins. Mm -hmm. But really interesting you had mentioned is leaky brain. Mm. And I don't think we talk enough about that, especially even in mental health. Mm -hmm. Is there, so, you know, you have that increase in inflammation, le leaky gut, mm -hmm. increase in inflammation, increasing blood brain barrier mm -hmm. permeability, you know, and then it's like a cycle, right? Because the mm -hmm. more inflammation, more gut, more inflammation, more gut. What you mentioned the cytokine model and of of anxiety, depression. Mm -hmm. um, what what exactly does that mean? The yeah, so cytokines are pro-inflammatory uh, cells uh, that our body produces. Again, not inherently bad, but we have these cells in our brain called the microglial cells, which up until recently, the like last five six years, were seen in science as sort of these nice like. Uh, janitors of the brain. And it was seen as the brain as being immune privileged, meaning there's n no immune processes 
in the brain and these glial cells were basically benign and not much attention was given to it. But it's interesting that microglial cells are, were uh, in the early 20th century lumped in with these other glial cells like the Schwann cells and the oligodendrocytes and the astrocytes. But the reality is that these microglial cells are these, these immune, mod it's the immune system of the brain. And when there's increased blood-brain barrier permeability, basically things are passing through the blood-brain barrier that shouldn't be, that can create this, this, this uh, inflammatory, can trigger this inflammatory process in the, in the brain. Um, and research is now looking at this neuroinflammatory process as being linked to all of these mental health issues. And what is, because when the microglial cell is calm, it actually prunes and checks on neurons, and it's a good thing, a part of its immune system in balance again. Mm -hmm. But when the microglial cell is thrown out of balance, it creates this inflammatory cascade throughout the brain, and we can quantify that on labs. We can run labs to measure blood-brain barrier permeability. We can measure abnormal autoimmune reactions in the brain uh, and, and inflammation of the brain. So these are, this isn't just conjecture. This isn't just some you know, doctor pontificating about these things. These are things you can see on a lab, get a baseline and do something about it. That's pretty incredible because we, you, we're so ingrained in at least old school antiquated conventional model mm -hmm. saying that, okay, you know, you have this neurotransmitter off, let's give you this medication mm -hmm. and therefore you will be better. I don't, yeah. I've never submitted to that because people don't necessarily get better. They may be palliated on the surface, but mm -hmm. um, it's pretty incredible to think that inflammation is a huge driving force mm -hmm. and, um, and, and how that can affect someone's just overall mood and how mm -hmm. they relate to the world. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. Dr. Amen, who's a pioneer in this space of mental health and looking at brain health, he says it best that psychiatry is the only school of medicine that doesn't look at the organ that's treating. You know, it's just like you have, here's this antidepressant. Well, what's going on in the brain? Exactly. That's a very oversimplistic view of all the complexities of mental health. Yeah, it's it's wild that you say that because it's mm -hmm. true. And that I've always had a problem with that because mm -hmm. I've had loved ones, you know, go mm -hmm. and get prescribed this antidepressant, which literally months from now can lead to more depression, Yeah, which is which is wild to hear. Anyway, yeah. so we're, we're talking about fasting, we're talking about brain health, and then I want to. I know. I know you're into this. What about what about fasting? Like, how how does fasting play its role into brain health? Mm, that's good. So it, there's exciting studies looking at fasting, doing a few things. I mean, we have to kind of back up a little bit. What is the best way to fast is really individual. So I, I, there's not a hard and fast rule as the the best way to intermittent fast or. Uh, the different you know protocols that are out there, but the reality is fasting uh, puts our body in a state of ketosis. So when you talk about the ketogenic diet that I talk about in Ketotarian, it is a fasting mimicking diet. That's a lot of the same research, a lot of the same mechanisms that you'll see in the research between the ketogenic diet and fasting are similar because they both produce ketosis, nutritional ketosis. So one of so, so this, this, several of the different pathways around centered around the brain is the fact that ketones, beta hydroxybutyrate, mm -hmm. can pass through that blood brain barrier mm -hmm. and act as a signaling molecule, an epigenetic modulator, meaning it does cool things for our brain and different parts of the body, but it lowers neuroinflammation. It's a natural endogenous anti inflammatory. It's like a, 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 your body's making a Tylenol or another anti-inflammatory without the side effects. Uh, and it helps to lower those neuroinflammatory cascades. It helps to bring things down like NF-kappa B and the NLRP3 inflammasome, all these things that are super high in people with mental health issues and autoimmune problems. Your body does that in a ketogenic diet, in a clean way, the way that I would advocate it, or and or in fasting. So it, it lowers inflammation. It upregulates these pro-antioxidant pathways, like the AMPK and the NRF2 pathway, and it improves, enhances autophagy, mm -hmm. which is sort of your brains and the rest of your body, but specifically we're talking about the brain that's recycling. It's sort of pruning these diseased, dysfunctional cells. So think of it as spring cleaning for your brain. Fasting does that, and it lowers blood sugar and so many other things too. I could go on and on about that. It improves mitochondrial function, 
so many things that you want for your brain. And then when people talk about like the brain boosting effects of fasting and the ketogenic diet, that's what's going on. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned fasting mimicking versus what dry fasting then uh, and, and how long, and you also mentioned autophagy, how long do people have to wait to get to that really golden area where they're getting cleaned up like mm -hmm. spring cleaning as I call it sometimes? <laughs> yeah. How long, how long does someone have to even wait for that? Well, it depends on their baseline, I guess, right? I mean, where, how much dysfunction is going on? What's your starting point? Uh, some people have to really get more meta metabolic flexibility, and that's going to take weeks it, to really tap into things because someone's really inflamed, really in the sugar-burning state. They are going to have to make some metabolic transitions to even tap into the benefits. So these are not quick-fix issues for many people struggling mm -hmm. with health problems. But the average person fasts, you could start seeing good uh, benefits of fast pretty quickly. In a couple of days, you'll start seeing benefits of that. Mm -hmm. But it all depends on how far you have to go to get to that zone. Mm -hmm. But lean into it, but don't do it too much too soon. Some people do be aggressive because they think yeah. aggressive is the best yeah. way. But it's not the best way if you end up, this isn't sustainable for you because mm -hmm. everything has to be predicated on the fact that this is a lifestyle. This is not a fad thing that you're going to try. This has to be a tool in your toolbox that has to be sustainable because being sustainable, no matter what practice you're talking about, that's the only way you're going to see the benefits, the cool benefits that we're talking about here. Okay. So you're a healthy guy. How often would you fast? Well, I do a most uh, this week in Los Angeles with all the amazing restaurants, I'm not doing that. <laughs> you can. It's so good here. <laughs> yeah. Man. But normally when I'm consulting patients, I will do a 12 to 6 window. Okay. So I'll do time-restricted feeding. I'll eat between 12 p.m. and 6 p.m. most days. Mm -hmm. Normally Monday through Thursday, I'll, I will do that. Mm -hmm. um, and there's good study, studies to show that that fasting window around there, and you don't have to do 12 to 6. You could do it earlier in the day if you wanted to do it, but about a six hour window, you could do an eight hour window if that's a little bit too much for you. Um, that's kind of a sweet spot for a lot of the studies out there to improve biomarkers, not just for the brain, but overall lowering inflammation. Okay, and how about not intermittent fast? How about like a week fast? Do, do you suggest that or is that too yeah. much on the body for folks? I, I, I haven't, no, I, I don't typically recommend that for, Many people, I mean, look, there, there's definitely aggressive cases where we need to dig into that, yeah. right? But um, for most people, I'm not doing that on a regular basis. I think you can get a lot of the same benefits with intermittent fasting, mm -hmm. making it more sustainable. Look, there are people that have very severe cases where they need to do some, some longer water fast or dry fast. Yeah. Those are, should be under the supervision yeah. of a doctor. But I think that you can do intermittent fasting without a doctor if you're doing more of these safe, more sustainable tools for people. I heard that fasting was the most researched term, medical term on Google. I would believe that. I have not heard that, but I, it makes sense. It, I mean, it, it's so it's so amazing. Now, you are, there's, there's those, you said fasting mimicking. Mm -hmm. You can eat during a fasting mimicking diet versus just like drinking water. Yeah. Correct. Well, the ketogenic diet is a fasting mimicking diet. I as think, a whole. As a whole. Okay, I see. So I think that the... What's being popularized right now is the research out of USC with Walter Longo. Yes. He's, you know, promoting his fasting mimicking diet and the Prolon mm -hmm. and the packet. That's one type of fasting mimicking diet. I talk about that in Ketotarian because the research is compelling, but it's not the only fasting mimicking diet. The ketogenic diet by its very definition is a fasting mimicking diet um, because it's high fat, moderate protein, low carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. So again, it's, it's going to have minimal effects on insulin. It's going to be eliciting a lot of the same health benefits as fasting without actually fasting. But the prolon and the fasting mimicking diet, as it is officially for Walter Longo, is restricted calories for five days. He recommends doing that once a month for people with these health goals to get to a certain point. And then less frequent for people that once they hit their goals. Okay. And how does intermittent fasting play in the role of weight loss? Because I know people will always want to lose weight, right? Yeah, so yeah. Um, is that something that you've seen some good evidence on? Oh, absolutely. So there's a lot of research centering around that fasting will improve biomarkers centered around weight loss resistance. And the leading cause of weight loss resistance in the West is insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. So these metabolic issues, the, the higher insulin levels, higher leptin levels, higher 
higher glucose levels, higher A1Cs, triglycerides, all of those things are normalized and lowered in a fasted state. And again, you have to lean into it. You don't wanna to go too much too soon, but the goal is to use this as a tool to start to move your body more into this fat adapted state. So your body can burn ketones and burning its own fat for fuel. Mm -hmm. um, and I, again, I'm not uh, implying that everybody has to be in ketosis forever and ever, but this is a tool to use to gain metabolic flexibility, to burn, fa burn fat for fuel, or the analogy is like a log on the fire. It's yeah. slow burning, that's your body burning fat and not burning sugar, which is like a, like a, a kindling on the fire. It's gonna burn f for a little bit, but then crash. Yeah. Yeah. And most people are in this sugar burning, kindling on the fire mode. Uh, where they are hangry and irritable if they miss a meal. Yeah. They cannot tap into their own fat stores because they're just burning kindling all day long. Yeah. So the way that, when, if you're talking about weight loss resistance, fasting is a great tool. A clean ketogenic diet is a great tool because again, it's, it's really the same mechanism. So, so for all of those benefits, you're saying in the intermittent fast, can one not eat a ketogenic diet then? Oh, yeah. And just intermittent fasting is okay or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's a good good point. So a lot of the research in the scientific literature centered around intermittent fasting is actually no dietary changes. Okay. And no, this is not caloric restriction either. So the studies that, the good studies that are done are actually keeping calories the same. One group doesn't change what they're doing and the, eating a certain set of calories. And then the other group does time-restricted feeding or intermittent fasting mm -hmm. with eating the same calories as the people that are doing no, no changes. And they see the benefits without changing anything about your diet. Mm -hmm. But they're in, tapping into ketosis during the time that they're intermittent fasting and then they go back out of it. That studies are pointing to to be beneficial for people. The way that I would just advocate it as an overall functional medicine, health and wellness standpoint is to be focusing on these clean foods yeah. when you are eating because that refeeding is quite important and to use food as medicine is a good part. I'm not an advocate to just you know, fast your way out of a poor diet, right. even though it is compelling to look at the studies and see, actually you can get benefits from that too. Yeah, and it's interesting because, you know, we have those rhythms throughout time and yeah. why are we eating at like 9, 30, 10 at night? Yeah. We're not really following our own circadian rhythms. Yeah. Um, so it's pretty, I mean, it's even intuitively like, of course, I do it myself. Yeah. Um, for sure. I'm not eating till like 11, 12, mm. for sure. And, and I feel better mm -hmm. since I've implemented that. Mm -hmm. And it was so simple to just yeah. not eat for, you get used to it yeah. after a while. So I, I'm sure a lot of people are like, oh, I need some food right now. I'm freaking out. It's like, I've been up for two hours already. Yeah, right. But, you know, like you said, you, you lean into it and yeah. you just start, you start getting used to it. A simple way is just 8 to 6 p.m. 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. You just eat within that window to your point of just not eating too late. Okay. That's the time that you're fasting through the night until you break the fast with breakfast. I'm not against breakfast. If someone loves their breakfast meal, if it's healthy and clean, then go for it. I'm not saying you have to the 12 to 6, but uh, these other tools to bring into your life, you can still have breakfast. I'm not anti-breakfast. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. So a lot of these... Um, viewers and listeners, they're really intrigued by the medicine that we're doing. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, it's sort of new to the surface. At least it's rising for sure. I know yeah. you've seen a change in the consciousness. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. What drove you from just being conventional to really moving into something that is functional medicine? Mm. Yeah. So I was always drawn to the integrative world anyway. So I never when I went to school, I knew that I wanted to be into integrative medicine from the from the onset. Um, I was at Southern California University of Health Sciences in Los Angeles, which is an integrative medicine school. So there's MDs and DCs and LACs and Love acupuncture, mm -hmm. or oriental medicine doctors, all kind of learning their craft. Uh, I had heard of a guy who had gone to my school. He was older than I was. And even today, he's still one of the Godfathers. It sounds like like not, not a good thing, but you know, uh, when I say like, I think of like a mob when I say the Godfathers. But it he is one of the leaders, the pioneers of mm -hmm. functional medicine, Detis Krasian, mm -hmm. and he was talking about this exciting field of healthcare called functional medicine. So that's how it narrowed for me from being this large, okay, integrative health based medicine to specific functional medicine, mm -hmm. uh, which. You're absolutely right. It's changed so much in the last yeah. decade. Yeah. When I first graduated, 
it was like, what are you talking about? This is crazy. How could you could say? How could you say you could re reverse diabetes? And how uh, you're just born with it, and there's nothing you can do. Now it's pretty much in common culture and knowledge for the most part that diabetes can be reversed, and these things are largely lifestyle-based problems. Of course, there's genetic predispositions for insulin resistance, but genetics for all of these things are just a slice of this puzzle. It's not the entirety of the puzzle. Amen. And mm -hmm. the, most of it is epigenetics, and that's what we're talking about, lifestyle stuff. Yeah, and the power of what everyone can do. And it's literally just preaching a little deeper than usual, which is something that I love about functional naturopathic medicine and integrative medicine as a whole. So I'm really happy that you've gone into it and become a leader yourself. Thank you. If they're a guy, if, if that's a godfather, then you're a good fella. <laughs> you know, I'm, ju I'm just following your lead, yeah, bro. Okay. You have these, this podcast. Mm -hmm. Is it new? It's relatively new. Okay. Yeah. What's the name of it? Goop fellas. That's actually the, the, the mob uh, yeah. <laughs> the analogies. Uh, are we're staying on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. And, uh, and you're, you're bringing all these people in talking about amazing stuff. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, I love that. I'm going to check you. it out. Yeah. You know, I just learned about it. Yeah. So it's Goop is Gwyneth Paltrow's brand. So Goop, uh, the Goop podcast is hosted by Gwyneth and Elise, who's the chief content officer. They host the main one. Yes. And then they said recently, they said, Hey, how about you hosting this Goop Fellas, which is their first spinoff? And it's kind of a guy's perspective on all this wellness, curious about life stuff. Yeah. Uh, so we're talking about real game changers in this space, in health and wellness, but in mental health space, in mm -hmm. entrepreneurial, like non-health stuff, just yeah. life itself. It's really cool. Yeah. yeah. We need that. We need, a, we need something for the men who are really interested in learning more yeah. for us, to advocate for us. Because mm -hmm. usually it's our girlfriends, it's our wives, mm -hmm. it's our moms, it's our sisters who are like, yeah. hey, hey, check out this guy's page. Yep. You know, Dr. Will, he's putting out some amazing stuff. Yeah. Oh, Dr. Gonzalez, look at it, check yeah. it out. But um, I, I'd like to see more men stand up yeah. and be like, you know what? Like, I'm sick of just taking this medicine and it doing nothing. Yeah. I'm in pain still. Mm -hmm. What else can I do? And there's a shift. It's like it's always happening, right? That yeah. consciousness change is happening. Yeah, I think it's cool. It definitely is cool. I think more you could see the statistics out there of guys getting more uh, awakened to these things, yeah. you know. And it's yes, I think it's the women in their life that have that are opening their eyes to these things. Mm -hmm. But now I think it's growing more and more. And guys are. It's amazing how many guys. Uh, more that guys that I'm consulting online than it was 10 years ago mm. because they're like, I want to run these yeah. labs. I, where am I at? I, I do feel like... I see that too, You know man. what I mean? It, it's, like, it's cool. It's really cool. And I think it's born out of necessity because they see where they're going and they're looking at what they're doing as being unsustainable. It's not working for them. Yep. And we have to do something different to see something different. And I love that the guys are late to the party, but they're, they're waking up. It's cool. Yeah, that is amazing. All right, so you have... Dr. Cole, what do you have coming on right now for the rest of us that you're excited about so we can look forward to anything? Uh, I, I'm i really immersing myself uh, in, because we're kind of done with the initial book pr uh, promotion stuff. And my day job, like I mentioned earlier, is still consulting patients online. And that's my focus. We've recently launched an online group class, which my goal over this year is to make, continue to make functional medicine more accessible and more affordable to people. Um, so we're enabling to mat to reach more people uh, and scale it appropriately so we can get them these labs that we've been talking about, mm -hmm. but it lowers the cost for them because I can talk to a hundred people in an online forum versus one-on-one, -on -one, which is only so many hours in the day yeah. to uh, run a clinic. So it's really cool to exponentially be helping more, more people and getting them this information so they can have agency over their wellness, which is what I want to do is really empower people to get this information, to do it for themselves. Um, I'm just there to point them in the right direction. Mm -hmm. We need that for yeah, sure because there's a lot of people who are like, oh, I want to see a naturopathic or functional doctor. I just can't afford it right now. Mm -hmm. I'm saving up for it. Yeah. Which to me is unacceptable at this point because mm -hmm. the power of what we do can completely change yeah. healthcare. And Absolutely. we should be compensated for that through insurance and everything. Yeah. But, um, in any case, before you go, mm -hmm. three things. Three things that people, viewers, listeners can do automatically that can help their health. Good. Yeah. So uh, three things that I would say is work, bring in healthy fats into your life because healthy fats, your brain is 60% fat. Your immune system needs healthy fats. 
uh, it, it's, it's a good stabilizer for human biochemistry. So all, things like avocados, extra virgin olive oil, olives, all of avocado oil, um, soaked nuts and seeds to make them more bioavailable, wild caught fish, grass fed beef, uh, bringing in healthy fats into your life and lower the amount of sugar, which most people that are listening right now know that already, but they need to do that and not just know it, but do it. <laughs> uh, and then I would say, really looking at stress as being a modulator of your biochemistry too. Because you could be eating really clean, but if you're serving your body a big slice of stress every day, or you know, stressing about your health isn't good for your health either. Yeah. So I think that all of this has to be under the context of grace and lightness and how can I love my body enough to feed it good things? And that should be the ethos that propels them to eating good things 100%. or doing good things, whatever they're doing. So those are three things. I would three say. easy things. Yeah. Three cheap things. <laughs> Super cheap. Right? We could do it yeah. starting tomorrow. So thank you, Doc, for coming on all the way from Pittsburgh. <laughs> How do we follow you? How do we find you? Everything's at drwillcole.com. It's D-R-W-I-L-L-C-O-L-E.com. Instagram at drwillcole. Yeah, they can find me. Beautiful. I appreciate the conversation and we look forward to having you again. Come back in the summer. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. All right. All right.